The year is 1968. Two giants would merge to create a British car empire, with a production capacity of 1 million cars per year. This empire was British Leyland, but this wasn't the only company that formed thanks to the merger of 1968. The merger of BMC and Leyland in the UK had a ripple effect, thanks to the overseas operations owned by both companies, one of which would become an infamous tragedy of lost opportunities and amazing cars. From the P76's lost future, and how a barn find unearthed 50 years after the demise of Leyland Australia proved it could have come to the UK, replacing the Rover P5. To the Marina 6, a six-cylinder Marina that should have been, the Austin Tasman, and the muscle of the Force 7. This is the tragic story of the rise and fall of Leyland Australia. Hello everybody and welcome to this video. If you're not subscribed already, please make sure to do so. It really does help me out and you get to see more of this. More car history, more cool projects, and more crazy conversions. In this video, we are going to be taking a dive into Leyland Australia with incredible cars like the P76, a car that could have potentially come to the UK. Make sure to like the video if you liked it and drop a comment below which one of these cars would you have liked to have seen succeed and what would you have potentially done differently. But without further delay, let's get into the video. The story of Leyland Australia starts with two British car industry giants, Lord Austin and Lord Nuffield. The classic intertwining story of Austin and Morris. Nuffield Australia would be first in 1946. Created by Lord Nuffield, founder of Morris Motors in the UK, in 1947, the firm purchased the former Victoria Park Racecourse to build a 57-acre plant, to build Morris Miners and Oxfords, in the form of knockdown kits to be fully assembled in Australia. Herbert Austin would found Austin Motor Company of Australia in 1949, after purchasing Ruskin Bodyworks in Melbourne primarily to create ute and Tora bodies for fitting to the Austin A40 chassis. In 1954, two years after the merger of Morris and Austin in Britain, they would merge their Australian operations to create BMC Australia. Meanwhile, that same year, in 1956, Rover Australia was formed, producing Land Rovers at Pressed Metal Corporation, based in Enfield. In 1960, Leyland Australia, established in 1919, would make their move as well into producing passenger cars in their new factory built two years earlier in Melbourne. They would begin the production of the standard range. In the late 50s and early 60s, these giants of industry would produce cars like the standard 8, 10 and Pennant from Leyland Motors. BMC Australia would produce the Austin Lancer and Morris Major, B-series powered saloon cars. These two cars were based on the Morris Minor platform. The Morris Marshall was next, a 2.6 litre six-cylinder car based on the Austin Westminster. The big seller though was the Riley 1.5, also based on the Morris Minor platform, serving as a cheap runaround with period refinements. The stage was set for a showdown in the marketplace, and in 1963, the Australian government launched a campaign for Australian-made cars. But thanks to prior investments by BMC and Leyland, they would be the perfect candidates. BMC would then introduce the Austin Freeway to finally challenge the Ford Falcon. The freeway would be based on the A60 Cambridge, going head-to-head -head with the Ford XM Falcon, one of the greats of Australian motoring. The new Austin would be powered by the 2.4-litre six-cylinder, which was locally built, known as the Blue Streak. This engine was a development of the B-Series and was the first time the company had challenged the dominant Holden and Ford Falcon models with their own locally built car. The Austin Freeway even got its own upmarket version with the Walsley 2480, based on the British 1560, but with the Blue Streak engine. In 1964, BMC Australia would introduce an automotive juggernaut, a car that was taking the market by storm at home and abroad, the BMC 1100, or ADO 16. The car would undergo over 30 modifications to make it suitable for the challenging terrain. On the inside, a bench front seat was added, and the handbrake was moved. On the outside, more improvements were implemented, overriders and a metal mesh sun visor on the windscreen to protect the occupants from the scorching sun. These are only a few of the modifications made to ADO 16 to make it suitable for the Australian market. I'll be covering BMC's world beta in a more in-depth video. 
That year, the Morris 1100 would be named the 1964 Wheels Car of the Year. Everything was going well for the miracle that was ADO 16. The Austin Freeway was another story. It wasn't doing too well, and Ford's Falcon Series had sadly beaten it, and with only 27,000 units in total sold, the freeway would be discontinued in 1965. At the same time, the locally produced Triumph 2000 was doing well, but its bigger brother, the 2.5 Pi, was suffering badly. Thanks to the lack of modifications to cope with the intense heat in the summer, the electric fuel pumps, which were originally derived from a windscreen wiper motor on the Lucas injection systems, would overheat, causing fuel to vaporise, rendering the car completely immobile. Three years later, in the UK, the ailing BMC and the fairly strong Leyland would merge to create British Leyland Motor Corporation, and as a result of this, the plug hole would also swallow up BMC Australia, Leyland Motors and Rover Australia to create British Leyland Australia. In mid-1969, another oddity would be launched under Morris, the logical evolution of ADO 16, the Morris Nomad. Essentially an ADO 16 with a boot under the code name YDO 15, this model would drop the A series in favour of the E series used in the Maxi. The production of the Nomad would only last two years. That same year, the Mark II Triumph Saloons would be launched, with the 2000 gaining a special variant, the Managing Director. A car fit for such a title. Features included exclusive knockoff wire wheels, triple Stromberg carburetors, and a battery move to the boot. These cars are exceedingly rare, with only 100 built. 1970 would be the start of a new era for Leyland Australia, with the launch of the Austin X6 range, a development of the Austin 1800. These new cars were named the Kimberley and the Tasman, based on the slightly longer version of the ADO 17 platform. These cars with their new boxy styling were complete redevelopments of the 1800, offering six seats. Thanks to characteristics inherited from the 1800, the car was incredibly rigid. Two utility vehicles based on the Tasman were tested with non-surviving. One of these cars was used by Leyland Australia staff as a pool car, while the other was crash tested. Two years later, the X6 range would be dropped, and it would be replaced with the Marina. Introduced in 1972 with the E-Series engine, but unfortunately there was a problem. Thanks to several instances of the new Leyland Marina being poorly built, and thanks to the rush to get it to market, the Marina was not modified enough to cope with the harsh conditions of its new home. The history of the Triumph 2.5 Pi was repeating itself again, and damaging Leyland's image. The result of all of this was the Marina's second chance had the same results as its first, thanks to the same factors plaguing its life at home. In spite of this, another marina was produced, one that many have stated would have been a success in the UK, the Marina 6, a six-cylinder 2.6-litre marina that could have been the most unassuming sleeper car ever, with the new 0-60 time of 9 seconds, beating the UK's top-spec 1800 marina at 12.5 seconds. Thankfully for Leyland Australia, there was something new on the horizon. A car that had its development set in motion four years earlier by a man on a mission. This man was David Beach, the MD of BMC Australia, pre-merger. David travelled across the world, from Australia to the UK, 9,500 miles away to pitch a new car. The make or break car for Leyland Australia. A fully in-house development, a saloon car fully developed in-house, fit for the Australian market to finally down Ford's Falcon. This car would be the Leyland P76. The car was approved in late 1968 under the provision that the Marina would come first. The P76's main design work commenced in March of 1969. Finally, the team at Leyland Australia had a clean sheet to make a car for the Australian market completely tailored to it. A car built for Australians by Australians. Meanwhile in the UK, Triumph were working on the Puma and Rover dropping the P8 for the SD1. And with the SD1 winning out, Michelotti would be entrusted with the P76's design in agreement with the Australian team. We are now at a point where we need to debunk a few things. This car has been wrongly rumoured to be a development of one of the existing British designs, but the P76 is not an evolution of the Triumph Puma or Rover P8. 
It does appear to be an evolution styling-wise of the Puma and its outward appearance, but this is due to it initially being penned by the same designer. David Beach of Leyland, Australia would amend the front and rear end styling before the launch. For the P76 to be the Falcon beater it needed an R&D budget to match, but sadly this was not to be. The Australian team were told they needed to use as many components as possible from British Leyland Motor Corporation's existing catalogue. This resulted in the car using a lot of the SD1's components. Sadly, the P76's development would then take another major downturn. Leyland Australia would start to see a slump in sales, mainly thanks to their lack of a competitive offering with the new Marina not having the boot capacity needed, it was failing in the market. The P76's development was in jeopardy. They had to stay the course by any means necessary. The company would then take out loans, amounting to 15 million Australian dollars at the time, which is around 105 million today. The P76 would finally emerge in June of 1973. The car that was to make or break Leyland Australia had finally launched, but it had come at the wrong time. By its launch, Leyland Australia had losses totaling 30 million dollars, which is around 210 million today. It was a truly grim backdrop for the launch of any new car. At 111 inches long, it was an absolute beast, but in the midst of an oil crisis, this was exactly what wasn't needed by the motoring public. Thankfully for the P76, it was beastly, yes, but it was a stylish one at that. Powered by the E-Series 1.8 inline 4 and a 2.6 litre inline 6, with the Rover V8 topping the range, enlarged to 4.4 litres, producing 192 brake horsepower. The P76 wasn't just stylish, it was easy to manufacture and maintain as well. The design team paid special attention to the body engineering of the car and manufacturing it at a reduced cost, reducing the amount of steel pressings needed to make the cars. The P76 would actually use less pressings than the BMC Mini. With the car being designed for the Australian market, it was designed with the capacity that the other British-derived Leyland cars lacked. But the boot was given particular attention, with its load space designed to take a 44-gallon drum in the rear. The P76 also had its paint colours based on the standard Dulux model codes, but they were renamed with some of the best names being Hairy Lime, Plum Loco and Boulders Brass. Another incredible car was also in the works. The P76 would have a stable mate, an incredible coupe version, the Force 7. This car was conceived by Barry Anderson, the deputy leader of the advanced model group within the company. This was Leyland Australia's plan to create a car to rebuild its now poor reputation. This was an Australian muscle car designed by Michelotti. As the project progressed into its advanced stages, 10 prototypes were produced. But then, in the final stages of the project, disaster would strike. Leyland Australia were now in a hole, and so were British Leyland. The entire British Leyland Empire was about to be brought to its knees, and Leyland Australia was also in debt to the tune of $30 million. During this time, the P76 was also under evaluation for introduction into the UK market, with several models being imported and tested. Two models were produced as demonstrators with the UK spec, with one going to London and another to Longbridge in Birmingham. The London car JOE is currently unaccounted for, but the second car is still around today, registered as a PLW 286L. In 1975, an ex-Rover apprentice purchased the car, and it was then sold to a Leyland dealer in Salisbury. The car would then go missing until 2022, where it was found languishing in a field in Farnborough, the ultimate Leyland barn find, or field find, the sole survivor of what was once proposed to be the replacement for the P5 saloon. The car was sold on eBay in December of that year for £1,950. And if you are the current owner or know the owner and would like to get in touch, I've got details in the description below to get in contact on my social media or via my email. After a prolonged financial struggle, in 1974, British Leyland Motor Corporation pulled the plug on Leyland Australia, with several incredible models lost to time. The Force 7's 10 prototypes were auctioned off, with all surviving. Another incredible oddity, or what if, was also auctioned off. The only P76 station wagon in existence, 
this car survives today. The P76, the car that was Leyland's last chance in Australia, was over before it had even begun. It was over before it was even given the chance to really compete in the market. All of that time, money, research and development, all lost after one year on the market. Leyland Australia's last chance saloon hadn't even been given a chance itself, and production ended with only 18,000 made. Production would continue until 1975. The closure of factories and industry operated by British Leyland Motor Corporation Australia resulted in 6,000 Leyland workers losing their jobs. But this wasn't the end just yet. Confusingly, the operations now named Leyland Motor Corporation of Australia would continue at limited capacity. The distribution arm Jaguar Rover Australia was sold back to Rover Group after being split off in 1987 with a management buyout. The company would then go into administration in October 1992, ending the strange saga of British Leyland's Australian operations. The Leyland P76 in particular was an automotive tragedy, a masterstroke in missed opportunity. Strangled development, launched at the wrong time by a loss-making company to turn their fortunes around and then not even given the chance it needed to do so. Do you have any cars you'd like me to cover? Let me know in the comments below. Let me know which one of these cars you'd like me to cover in more detail. But as always, thank you for watching, keep watching and remember to subscribe for more of this and I'll see you in the next one.